Um, so uh, I'm thrilled that Sharon is doing this. Sharon has been teaching uh, for us for many, many, many years, and she's um, very, very loved. And, um, and she's embraced Zoom and she's teaching three classes for us. So what she's gonna be doing today is most kind of, um, most closely related to her impressionism into Fauvism class. I probably said that right, wrong, Fauvism, there it is. Okay. Um, but she also teaches an abstract class and a color, creative color mixing class. So um, she'll maybe talk to you a little bit about that. So let's get started. Can you hear me? Yes. Can everybody hear me? Wave your hand a little bit. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. Welcome and thank you for joining this demonstration. I want to tell you a little bit about um, the class, the, fo the Impressionism into Fauve class. Um, the Impressionists uh, were our painters who branched off from the academy in painting. The painters like uh, Claude Monet and, and Degas and a few other, a lot of others actually, uh, they did soft, beautiful impressionistic paintings because they were, they were tired of being in the academy and staying and doing the same sorts of things. So they branched off and they were the first ones to do so. The academy really didn't accept them and wouldn't let them show with them, so they had their own shows. So after the uh, Impressionists, along came the Fauvists. The Fauvists decided that they were tired of doing Impressionist paintings um, and Post-Impressionist and Neo-Impressionism. So they decided they wanted to have a lot more fun. They wanted to get into a lot of color. They wanted to break up the picture plane. They didn't want to be so concerned about doing perspective and all of those rules and regulations, but they knew them all. They knew them all. So they had those tools at their, at their fingertips. We're talking about people like Henri Matisse and Andre Duran, um, who did some incredibly wonderful paintings. Henri Matisse is the only um, artist that stayed in Fauvism uh, the, all of his career. He did very, very well at, with it. It's why he is known uh, so well uh, as the father of Fauvism, because he stayed there. Um, the other artists moved on and carried those, those ideas of Fauvism into other things. One of the things they carried it into and one of the prelims to abstract, abstract painting are the Fauvists. Fauvists. I say Fauve as well. Uh, so uh, Fauvism was crucial into leaving the image and, and subtracting the image and going into abstraction, which is what I talk about in my abstract painting class. So I would like to show you a few things that we're going to do in this Impressionist into Fauvism class. Uh, we're starting with images that I send out to you um, and drawings that I help you with. And we start doing an Impressionist painting. The demo today is going to be of an Impressionist painting. So I'm going to show you some images. I'm going to put the camera on. Image number one is a landscape. So I send an image of this sort of this sort of landscape. And let me let me do that again because it's a little bit foggy on my end and it may be on yours. Try it again. Sometimes the camera does that. It should straighten out in a minute. But basically, Impressionist painting is big brush strokes and not doing hard edge lines and just doing the impression of a painting and not trying to make it like a realist painting. So from this, after we do our impressionist painting, we go in and we do a Fauvist painting. And we do some drawings, we take the same image and we do some drawings like this in our sketchbooks to come up with a Fauve painting with lots of bright colors, a lot of the same kinds of composition or form that is already in the image that we have done. And then we do a painting from that, which comes up like so. So this is a Fauve painting of the Impressionist painting. It's just a way to get you into thinking about how they did things. You can see all the bright colors. You can see how it's almost flattened out the perspective is not right on. So that is one image that one of the kinds of images we will do. Another is 
Here's another Impressionist painting that we worked on. I'll pull it back a little bit. So we did this piece first. Uh, we did sketches in our sketchbook along with my help. I always send you out these images. And then we did, we changed it up to another image, up into a focus image, which is quite different and a lot of fun. There are a lot of fun to do. So that's our still life. Uh, then we did, we did a, a lands, another landscape, which is water. So this is La Jolla Cove, actually, out by the cliffs there, over by the caves. So we went from this, doing some drawings again in our sketchbook and working on it. We don't have to do the drawings, but a lot of people like to. I like to, because it gives me a roadmap into where I'm going. Then we did something like this. Okay. So that's our seascape. And then one more. This is one, we just did this one. Here again is our impressionist piece. And this is a wet into wet technique, if, if I didn't mention that before, where we paint wet paint into wet paint. Uh, this is what the impressionists used as well. They painted outside a lot. So this was, they had to work very quickly. And then we did a fauve image of the same piece, as you can see, it's very different, very different, All right? So that is as far as I want to go with that because I want to get us into um, our, our, um, our little demonstration here. So the piece that we're going to do, and you have it sent out to you, is we are going to do this image here. And the way I like to start this is I like to make a simple graph on the image, because I can erase this if I want to, if I want to keep this image. And sometimes with my photographs, I do want to do that. So what we are going to do is a value study of this. In painting, one of the most important things in our painting are the values. And the Impressionist painters basically only used four values in their painting. So this is what I'd like you to draw out very casually on your, on your um, canvas. I'm going to do mine a little bit bigger so you can see it. So I'm going to do that same simple graph here on the canvas so I can see where everything is. I wonder why this is so foggy. I think it it because you had your head in front of it, Sharon. So oh, did that refocused? Me? It refocused on the back of your head and then okay. the back in view. <laughs> my, the back of my head's not very interesting, <laughs> especially to paint. Okay, here we go. All right. So what we're going to do is just draw this out very casually. You don't have to make it perfect. Um, just to get the handle of the teapot here. This is how I like to start the Impressionist paintings and how I like to start the faux paintings. And believe it or not, I will do this with my abstract paintings as well. It's just a roadmap to see where I'm going to go. It doesn't mean that I can't change things around. It can. So you can see by the graph. Draw it out very casually. And you can just make a simple teapot if you want to. It doesn't have to look like mine. Then we have this lemon here. We have a lemon over here. It's a lemon slice. And we have a, a lemon over here. Notice I don't make the fruits completely round. I give them angles. Most fruit is not completely round. And I'm just drawing in that little shadow that's under the lemon there. And then you can see a shadow over here, a shadow of that, a reflection of the lemon slice on the table. And this shadow of the lemon onto the tea kettle up here. That's as much as I'm gonna do. That's all I'm gonna do. Then I'm gonna do what I call a blue line. And the blue line is simply to save the drawing that I have. 
That doesn't mean I can't change it up. It just means I want to basically keep what I've got here right now. So for those of you who are painting in oil, I use the ultramarine blue. I used to do the same in the acrylic. The ultramarine blue in the oil dries so much faster. So we can start painting on this right away. So I'm gonna do a blue line right over my drawing here, just really casually, not too dark. I don't want a dark line like that. I just want a thin kind of sketchy line. And this is a time you can do some corrections on your drawing if you are pleased with it. Just gonna get that handle in. Make changes on it. my tea, spout of the teapot. Little more of the handle. So the, the impressionists try not to use more than four values in their painting. You really don't need more than four values in the painting. It just gets too eclectic and too realistic if you tr do try to make too many values. That doesn't mean that you can't. It just means that it's a good place to start to do an impressionist painting, leaving out lots of different, lots of different lines and, and lots of different uh, values. Okay, so I'm getting this little drawing in here pretty quickly. And you don't have to go as fast as me. I go a little faster so I can get it all in and you can just watch me because um, I know a few of you are already doing that. Here's my shadow, here's the bottom of the tea kettle and my horizon line or the well, the line between the table and the, the wall is right about here. Here's my lemon wedge. Some shadows down here. Kind of the shadow of the lemon here and the reflection here. And then I see that nice shadow coming out from the apple over here. That's it. That's all I'm going to do on my blue line. So in a few, just maybe no more really than a minute, this ultramarine blue paint will dry and I can erase the charcoal. Now I erase the charcoal because the charcoal can, can go in when you start doing your painting and can muddy up your paint. And some people don't like that. I like to keep my pure. So let's see, see this is already dry. And if you're working in acrylic, of course it dries very quickly. So I take a terry cloth towel and if I have my charcoals too dark, I will just bat off the charcoal first. And that helps the blue dry even a little more. So now I can erase my grid. I can erase all that charcoal. Next, I am going to start in on my value study. I'm going to do, like I said, only four values. I always start with the darkest darks first. Why? I start with the darkest darks because it is very easy to paint light paint over dark paint. If I try to put dark paint over light paint, that light paint will mix in. Keeping in mind that we are doing an a la prima, a wet into wet painting. So we want to be able to paint over that dark and get our medium tones in when we actually get to the painting part of the, of the, of the image. So I'm squinting my eyes to look at my image and I'm seeing where the darkest darks are on this. And I can see that it's this side of the tea kettle, this side of the, the uh, spout of the tea kettle and this whole side down in here. 
and the handle is dark. And then I can see there's a dark side on the lemon, a dark shadow here under the pot, and a dark shadow over on, in between the apple and the lemon. So I'm gonna go ahead in and I'm gonna use a bigger brush. This is about an eight. You're working on smaller canvases probably, so you would use whatever is convenient to you. So I'm going to, I'm using just the turpenoid to do this, no white paint. So if you're, you're using oil, be sure you're not using your white paint. We're gonna use the turpenoid to thin the colors, to thin the value, sorry. So I'm going to go and casually drop in those dark shadows. Down here. So when I actually do the painting, I like to let a lot of this beautiful blue shine through because it adds gives a continuity to the painting, just sparkles of it come, come through, creates a beautiful surface. So there's the shadow of my, my lemon. And then the handle, outside of the handle is pretty dark. So the light on this image is actually coming from the right hand upper quadrant. So you can see all of our lightest lights of this four part, this four part value study are from the very darkest dark, the dark blue to almost white. All right. And then I, this shadow over in here is fairly dark. And then the shadow underneath the pot is dark. It's not as dark, we can correct that later, but we wanna recognize it because it's gonna be easy to paint a lighter value of paint, of color over this area when we get there. All right, there's my first value, the darkest dark. So now I'm gonna go in, well, there's a little bit of dark on the, on the lid, on the, knob of the lid up here and a little bit over here. You can see I'm kind of correcting as I'm going along because I didn't get some of the lines in there properly. I didn't get the handle in properly, but that's okay. It still looks like a tea kettle to me. I'm fine with that. It does not have to be perfect. Okay, so now I want to do the next value. Now in this piece, the next value, when I look at it, it looks like the table's very dark. Well, I don't want to do it dark because I don't think it's gonna be that nice looking within this painting. So it's going to be my second value. So I'm going to water down my, my with the turpentine, I'm gonna water down the blue, the ultramarine blue, and I'm gonna get my second value in. And because I know that that the light is coming from the up, upper right-hand quadrant, I know that this part of the painting in the background is going to be darker. It's going to be about the same darkness as my table on this side. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to block that in as well right after I do this second value down here on the table. So I'm going to a lot more and I'm going to block in this background. Same, but it's just about the same value, value number two. If it gets too dark, just take your rag and block off a little bit. And over here under the handle, oopsie, I got that way too dark. Got to add a little more turpenoid to that. So there we go with our second value. Okay. 
If it's not dark enough, I'll go back in later and add a little more. It's back and forth, back and forth. Our third value is this light area over in here and on the teapot in this area here. So I'm going to add even more of the terpenoid and drop in. And it's a little bit dark, so I'm just going to lighten it a bit with my rag. We're going to completely cover this canvas with our values. Of course, I completely forgot my fruit, so I'm going to have to go back in with that. It's okay, I can do that. So this side of the, of the lemon is a little bit darker, not as dark as the pot, but I can see a shadow there. Can you see a shadow on the apple? This is the number two value. We've gone skipped back to that because I forgot to do that. So back to the number three value. Teapot. You see how casually I'm doing it. Okay. Now my lightest lights are the white, the white areas. So I need to do a little more up here of value number three. And I can see that it, I can drop in value number two on the light side of the handle. And I can drop in value number two on the nozzle. So we can see that this lemon here is really the lightest light. So I am going to just, just watery. This lightest light is really watery. And if it's not light enough, I'm going to take my rag and I'm going to just dampen off, block off some of that darker value. So I can change this up over here. I can make this a little darker up in here. Right? It's going to be a little darker here. So now, there is my value study. Now I am ready to add paint to it. I'm ready to apply the paint. Now we're not going to add the paint today, but I'm going to show you where it goes. So once we have our value study, we know where we're going to put all of our colors. Is everybody doing okay? I haven't, haven't checked in with you. All right, if you have any questions, please unmute yourself and please ask me. I'm very happy to answer. So the next thing that we're going to do after we have our value study done, and we can paint right over this, even though it may be wet, because we are doing wet into wet. Here is where we go next. Is Actually, start... I, I would like to ask a quick question. Yes, so please. Assume if you're using acrylic, you then be putting medium in with it, not water, but medium. No, no, you can use water. You can use water. You just water it okay. down more. Yes, you just thin okay. it up with water. Good okay. question. Thank Thanks. you for asking that. So here's where we go next. And you can see when we do our copper kettle, we're going to do the darkest darks first. You can see we've, we've got it all laid out for us. And then we do the, then we do the second value, which is the background and part of the table. And then we do the third value on the pot. Here's where we're going to apply all of our color and with the, with the, with, on the apple. So this is, our, this, is our, this is where we're going with it. The next thing we're going to do after we do this is we're going to go to our sketchbooks. And with my help and with your imaginations um, and your creative juices, we're going to create a fauve painting from this. And the fauve painting is going to look something like this. 
we're going to get real bright and bold with it and have some fun with it. Actually, before we move on, can yeah. you tell us what, what colors you mixed for the copper? Ah, yes. Okay, I the, the palette that I use is Alice are, uh, I, you'll see on my, um, on the description for the materials, I only use eight tubes of paint to mix all of these colors. And copper color is a mixture of, of, uh, of, the, let me get my, of, of the alizarin crimson, the ultramarine blue, the cad red light, and a touch of orange. And to bring down the brightness of it, I do I add a touch of what is called mud. And mud is, a, is what the impressionists use to gray down their colors. And I am going to bring up my, that's a great question. So that's, those are the colors that I use and I mix them all. I mix all of the greens. I, the greens are mixed uh, with, um, with the uh, ultramarine blue and the cad yellow light. And we mix three values of green in class when we do it. I'm gonna show you my master palette so you can see what I'm talking about. So I'm gonna hold this up for you. Can you see this? These, all of these, that, all of these tertiary colors here are mixed from these colors up here. Every one of them. Oh, the purple one's not. That's got some, uh, some uh, purple from a tube in it. But all of these greens are mixed with, the, with these yellows and the ultramarine blue and the cerulean blue. So you don't need to buy a whole lot of paint to paint like this. So we go over some color theory in class. I always talk to you about how we mix the colors. We talk about composition. We talk about um, line and form. We also talk a lot about the, uh, the masters who did this. I like to show a lot of examples of some of the greats who um, were in these, these, these wonderful genres of art. Does anyone have any questions? Uh, yes, I do. Um, I wonder if you could go back a minute and show yes. the screen with the values. I'm a little behind and I wanted to take a screenshot Good. of Please. the values done so that I can work on this on my own. Perfect, perfect. Yes, yes. In okay. fact, I can, sh I, can, I can show you one that I, that I do even more of. And th this, this is, is more, I did this for an example for another class and I thought, okay, we don't have time to take it this far and you okay. don't really need to take it that far. I like it. I, I don't want to paint over it because I like the value study, but why don't you take a, a snap of that? And if you like, like, I can hold up this other one and you can take a snap of it. Could you, you? I've taken both of them. Thank you. Oh, you are very welcome. Well, I, I have a question. Yes. So, You've started with blue. Is that because it was a convention of the Impressionists to use blue? Yes, it was. It was. Uh, so it's painting in blue. Yes. Well, they 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 did not like to use black, uh, and they did so when they were starting to mix and to to uh, blend colors and to gray them out. They used what is called mud. And let me hold this up again. Here is what the mud is. This is what uh -huh. the, the toned down colors, which okay. is four parts titanium white and one part ultramarine blue. Okay. So when they, a lot of times when they were painting Alina, they liked to stain their canvas a different color. Some of them used blue, some of them, uh, Monet liked really, he liked using a blue gray. Okay. So, and he would, to make it a little more gray than blue like this, he would add a tiny touch of orange, which would take out the blue. It's the opposite. Okay. They are complementary colors. And when you use a, um, a complementary color to tone down, it turn, they turn gray. Okay. So the, the, the final question is, um, you, not, you said you do not wait for the underpainting to dry? 
No, not necessarily. When I'm demonstrating in class, I just move right on. I see. Okay. But it does okay. dry pretty quickly. I mean, this one's, it's a little wet still, but I mean, it doesn't have to be. And sometimes that helps create color, what is called color harmony. Some of the blue mixes in with the paint and creates a harmonizing effect with the paints. Very nice. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, people? Yes, I have a question. Yes. For your course, um, the Impressionism and Euphorbism, um, can we do that with acrylics? Yes, you can. Absolutely. How, are you experienced with acrylics? Uh, not really experienced, but I do a little bit. <laughs> okay. All yeah. right. Do you have oil paints? No, I don't have oils. I've only got acrylics. Okay. We can work with what other what uh, whatever colors that you have. That's just fine. Okay. Thanks. Don't worry. Yes. Um, Any other I questions? Just, yes, Linda. I, uh, oh. Yes, please. Uh, um, okay, I'll, I'll go ahead. It's Linda. Thank you for this, Sharon. It's been really interesting. I'm just curious. Your your path is from Impressionism into Fauvism. Do you ever just take the leap from the picture into Fauvism? <coughs> or, or is the Impressionism sort of a guiding point? It is a... To Fauvism? Okay, excellent question. Thank you for that. <coughs> It is a guide in, and it's only a guide in, in terms of composition. I, I like to give okay. a place to start off. And I've had students come in and go, well, I don't want to do the impressionist painting. Fine, you go ahead and you can do the Phobos painting. Um, and you can also use your own images. You do not have to use my image. Uh, so you're, you're free to do that. And I go from Impressionism into Fauvism because the next step, the next class is abstraction. Mm. So this is how, this is where abstraction really, it started with the Impressionists and then it moved on. There were, a, a, I don't know, four or five other genres of, of isms between Impressionism and Fauvism. Mm -hmm. But the next step with the Fauvists was really going into abstraction. If you look at Claude Monet's work in his later years, he was starting to leave out the image entirely. And, and his, his um, lilies, the, the lily ponds that he did that are in the lingerie in Paris, it's hard. You can tell that it is the, the lily ponds in Givernay, but if if you squint your eyes, all you see is abstraction. If you turn them upside down, they turn entirely abstract. So it's my progression from impressionism into fauvism into abstraction. And the, and the beginning of it even more so for people who have not painted for a long time or for new painters, I have a color mixing which is really color theory and painting class. I do some charts in color in color theory, um, I, I will have you say, for instance, I will have you uh, do a, a value study first, then I'll have you do keys of contrast, then I'll have you do the color wheel, then I will have you do uh, uh, a, a, a bunch of exercises off of that. Say, for instance, for green, we'll do a whole green chart. A human being sees over 3 million, 30, no, 30 million colors of green. So we're not going to get them all in, but we're going to do a nice chart that will be, will be greens that you can work in in your landscapes uh, most of the time. Uh, so from the green chart, we do a green painting. From a red chart, we do a red painting. It's a lot of fun, and it, and it takes the color theory, and it makes it not so scientific. It takes it right from the science into the art, into the creativity with it. Mm -hmm. And do you incorporate some of the color theory into the Impressionism, into Fauvism as good, well? Good question. Yes, I do at all times. I go in because we're mixing all of these colors. It's really mm -hmm. a necessity and it's something I like doing because it's always, you'd think you'd have it all memorized by the time, I mean, I've done it so many times, but you know, you don't. You don't it's like how do I you you saw me hesitate when I was asked the question how do I how did you mix the copper um, I had to think I had to think I mean I always get there but sometimes I'm going how did I do that 
Yeah. <laughs> like people buy tubes of yellow okra. Yellow okra is so easy to make. All of these, these um, uh, burnt umber, raw umber, all of them, we can make them with these eight colors. Mm -hmm. It saves on buying the paint. Plus, you get an idea of where color is coming from. It's really valuable to know when you start working on your, your shadows and all the different kinds of work that we do, um, you start to see that you, you don't need to buy all of those paints. You can really see where it's all coming from after, after you've done it for a while. I just wanted to say I put the um, in the chat, I put the names of the three classes that Sharon teaches and links to more information about um, all of them. So if you wanted to look those up, you can just go to our website too, of course, and, um, and look for those. Uh, what do people want to hold up their paintings? Can we see everybody yeah. we can switch to a gallery view and see what every everybody made? Oh, wow. look at Elena. Oh, my goodness. Ah, Patricia, oh. that's good. I like yours, it's very stylized. Yes, look at you, guy. you guys. That's wonderful. Barbara, you did yours in black and white. You did monotone, that's wonderful. That's a nice way to start as well. Debbie, good work, good work. Oh, Leanne, I can almost see yours. You're on your iPhone. <laughs> Anybody else? Good work, people, good work. So next, we just go into color. If I had more time, I would we'd do it. Oh, look at Leanne's. That's very nice, Leanne. Beautiful work. I'm really impressed. That was 20 I minutes. I too. <laughs> good work. Yeah. Really good work. Really must, good work. It must be the teacher. It's the teacher. <laughs> <laughs> well, join me if you can. The class is a lot of fun. We cover a lot of territory. We do a lot of different kinds of painting. I've just shown you about four different ones that we work from. But we also like to do a portrait, which everybody goes, oh, no, portrait, don't I want to do a portrait? But they're really lots of fun because they're easy. When you're doing them impressionistically, you're not looking for all that detail. You're looking for something different. And when we get to the faux painting of a portrait, it gets hilarious. <laughs> it gets to be a lot of fun because you're not trying to do uh, the image the way that it's presented in a photograph. We work from photographs, but photographs are really just a starting place. We don't want to do the photograph exactly. But, you know, when we're starting out and we haven't painted for a long time or we've never painted, it's a good place to start. Um, and I, I'm always talking about, you know, you need to make the photograph your own. You, you get to compose from the photograph. Uh, take what you want from it. And when we get to impre in to abstract painting, I also give a lot of photographic images. And I tell people, just use the colors. Just use some of the lines. You don't have to do all of this. And I have my ways of taking you into all a, a lot of different abstract paintings. Um, and we talk a lot about that. So that's, that's an interesting class as well. And that class I will be teaching in, in down at the Bread and Salt this summer. So you might, if you're interested in abstract uh, painting, that's, um, that's a possibility. I think, Barbara, did you have a question? Yes, I worked in watercolor. Ah. Were you doing acrylic and then putting paint over the acrylic? You can, yes. I, I no, I am, I'm painting in oil, but you can always do your value oh, yeah. study and you can do half of your painting in acrylic and then you can take oil paint and go over the acrylic with all those big lush delicious oil colors. You can't do the opposite. Oh. However. You can't put, uh, yes, yeah. Miss Barbara. Oh, I'm just working in watercolor. So that's fine. I would just take, take this, uh, sketch and then do the colors on another one. Yes, yes. In watercolor. Instead of going over it. Yes, yeah. you can do okay. in watercolor, you can do this value study in just washes. Washes of the watercolors that you're using. Right. It works beautifully. It really does. And then you can do dry point over the washes uh, with with really heavy um, opaque watercolor. Or you can use gouache. Right. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, people? No? I so appreciate you coming today. And um, 
and, and coming into the demonstration. I'd love to see you in the classes. We do have a lot of fun. Um, Amanda said something about Zoom earlier. When she first approached me about doing Zoom, I thought, how am I gonna do that? Uh, and I'm so thankful that I did do it. I've learned so much by doing this online. It's really very feasible. We have a lot of fun. There's a lot of camaraderie and collaboration. When we share our paintings, we learn from one another. A mistake that I've made, maybe two other people have made, and we can talk about it and go, okay, here's how you straighten it out. And also, um, I, I like for you to, uh, when you're if you have questions during the week, if you're working on your paintings, you're always free to send me an image of it, email it to me or text it to me, and I can give you a critique. I can tell you what needs to be done or not done. Um, so we have that as well. There's a lot of communication that goes on with this technology that I didn't realize would work so well, but it actually really does. It does work well. So any other questions, people? So Sharon, your yes. your next class is I'm sorry, it's Linda. Your this yes. coming class will be online, yes. and in the summer the color class will be at the Bread and Salt Building. It sounds like you're going live, and is that correct? Uh, no, it, the uh, abstract class is going oh, to go is down there, and the color the color mixing and painting class works really well online because yeah. you, I'm doing it right along with you. That's another thing, people, is I do my demos right in front of you. And it's not me about my painting, it's you seeing how I go about the, about the technique. So I'm not just always painting in front of you, I will be communicating with you and asking you to show me your work and, uh, and you can just hold it up and we can talk about it. All right, it's not just about me painting in front of you. <laughs> Great, right. thank you. My pleasure, my pleasure. Any other questions? Did you have a question, Debbie? You have to unmute yourself. Oh, you don't? Okay. There. Just know, it, Sharon's a wonderful teacher. I've taken a class before. Debbie, yes. that's yes. you. Oh my gosh, hi. And Linda, I haven't I seen you before, Linda? Um, perhaps so. I mean, you look familiar to me as well. I've... Were, you, were you in Catherine Gray one's classes? Yes. Amen. Yes. We were together. We were sisters. Oh, that's great. As soon as you started talking about mud, I, it all came back to me. <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's great. That's great. Yeah. Um, yeah. just yeah. for those of you who don't, Catherine Gray one was a very, very dear friend and mentor of mine. She worked at the Athenaeum, um, for about a year and a half and, became ill and I substituted for her, which led into me teaching at the Anthenaeum. Uh, she was a fabulous teacher. I miss her terribly, uh, but she yeah. lives on. She lives on mm -hmm. through her work. So any other questions? I'd just like to say thank you. Thank My you. Pleasure. Thank you, yes. Sharon. Thank this you. was really wonderful. Yeah, that was a great demo, Sharon. Thank Thanks you. so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. I like those clapping hands, Fabola. <laughs> Fabiola. Bye-bye, <laughs> people. Thanks again. Thank you. Thank you, Sharon. Thank you. Bye.